How did we get our Bible? Are there lost books of the Bible? And did Constantine decide what went into the Bible? Isn't the Bible corrupt? I mean, we don't have the same Bible they had back then. All of those questions are going to be answered on today's podcast, How We Got Our Bible. First, before we do anything, we have to have an understanding of what we mean when we say the Bible is inspired. When I was a little kid in Sunday school, I would hear the question, who wrote the Bible? And we put up our hand, the answer, God. Well, that's a good way for maybe a three or four year old to understand, but it's a little more complicated than that. And we are setting these truths forth in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Holy Spirit combining and interpreting spiritual truth with spiritual language to those who possess the Holy Spirit. The Bible was written by many different people, over 40 different authors, a lot more than 40 if you start looking at the Psalms and how many different authors there are in the Psalms. But yet we believe the Bible has no flaws. We believe it's true. We believe it can be trusted. That's because we believe the Bible is inspired. That means the Holy Spirit controlled the process of what was written, but he also controls the process of the choosing of the books. Even though the Holy Spirit controlled the process of the writing of the books, we see very clear difference in style from one writer to the next. I heard it explained this way one time and it really made sense for me. Imagine a great musician stands up to play. He holds in his hand a flute. He breathes through the flute and beautiful music is heard. He then puts the flute down and picks up a saxophone. Once again, beautiful music is heard. He then puts down the saxophone and picks up a clarinet. And once again, beautiful music is heard. Each of these instruments sound very different one from another, and yet they're all played by the same musician. Each of the writers of the Bible were instruments used by the Holy Spirit to write the Bible. They each sound very different one from another, but they were all used by the Holy Spirit. Over the years, I've heard many things about the Bible, and most Christians are not able to answer these questions or these accusations. Some say we have a corrupted version of the Bible. Some say Constantine actually picked which books went in the Bible. Some say we have lost books of the Bible. The reason most Christians can't answer these questions is that we don't know anything about church history. The word we use to describe the Bible is the canon. This is the Greek word that simply means a measurement or a standard. It's also a list of books the church considered to be authentic books of the Bible. Before we jump into the New Testament, let's just briefly look at the Old Testament. The Jewish people gave us the Old Testament and they were extremely careful on how they copied the scriptures. In fact, if one mistake was found in a copy, the entire thing was destroyed. The measurements on the page even had to be exact and each letter had to be copied by looking at it and then writing it down. In the time period right before Jesus came, the Old Testament was translated into Greek because that's what most people were reading and speaking. This is called the Septuagint. Did you know the Old Testament was actually the first book ever to be translated into another language? 70 different Jewish scholars from each of the 12 tribes of Israel translated the Hebrew scriptures into Greek so it could be read by everyone. Jesus, when he was alive, he read the scriptures. This would be the Old Testament. And the early church only had the Old Testament. In fact, Paul said to Timothy that he had studied the scriptures since he was a child. That would mean he studied the Old Testament. The New Testament was finished being written by the year in 90 AD. That means it was all written in a time period when people who knew Jesus were still alive. But we have 27 books. They had much more than 27 books by the end of this time period. And after this time period, even more books were written. No one actually sat down and decided, hey, let's write a New Testament. No one was actually trying to write a Bible. They didn't realize what the Holy Spirit was doing through them. God was forming the New Testament through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was telling the men what to write and the Holy Spirit was collecting the books. 
We talked about this in our episode, The New Testament is Written. So if you haven't listened to that, please go back and listen to it. By the start of the second century, less than a hundred years after Jesus' death, there was two series that were being passed around and shared, the Gospels and the Letters of Paul. These two books had the four Gospels we have today and all of the letters written by Paul. In our episode, Just a Pinch, we talked about Justin Martyr. Remember, he was the philosopher who became a Christian and debated with false doctrine and pagans. And he was killed by beheading when he refused to offer incense before a debate. Justin wrote a book called The Harmony of the Gospels. In this book, he put the four Gospels in the order of how they happened. Already, the church had accepted the four Gospels as truth. Around this time, the book of Acts was added to some of the copies of the Gospels and the letters. It was added to the end of the Gospels or the beginning of the Pauline books. When someone wanted a copy of one of these books, they'd have to pay a scribe to travel to the place where a church had a copy of the book. The scribe would then stay at this church and copy the whole thing, then return to you with a copy of the book. This, of course, took money, and the church would have to raise money to get copies. Because of this, only the books the church felt were most important were copied. A few more wealthy people had their own personal copies of books. If someone had a collection of books, besides the Old Testament, the two books that they would have started with were the collection of Gospels and the letters of Paul, and one of those books probably had a copy of Acts. Other books were also copied, but these two were seen as the most important. Then a man named Marcin came on the scene in the year 140. He hated the Jewish people and he wanted the church completely separated from the Jews. He produced one book that he claimed was the complete canon. It left out the Old Testament completely and took out any reference to the Jewish people from the letters of Paul and it only had one gospel. Irenaeus also put together a New Testament into one book. Irenaeus put the 13 letters of Paul, the Gospels, Acts, and 1 Peter. He also recommended the reading of the Shepherd of Hermas, but didn't add it. We talked about Oregon in our episode, Theologians, Heresy, and Legends. Origen was the very important part of church history. He produced a canon as well in defiance of Marcion. In Oregon's canon, all 27 books we have today are in there. Although he makes a comment that he is unsure of 2 Peter, the three books of John, Jude, or the Apocalypse of John, which we call the book of Revelation, actually should be part of the canon. Origen also had added other books that we don't have in our New Testament. The church did come up with some rules at this point, but for the most part, they were really just confirming what the church had already started to do under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. The church came up with six rules. First of all, the Old Testament was complete and inspired. The New Testament does not cancel out the Old Testament. The gospel is four parts. There's 13 letters of Paul and letters from other apostles were also inspired. And also the letter of Acts was inspired. Then came a time in church history when all Christian books were to be burned. Diocletian ordered the burning of all the Bibles in the year 303 to 306. During this heavy persecution time, it was the 27 books we have today that were hidden and the others were taken and destroyed by Rome. By this point, the Gospels, the letters of Paul, Jude, and John's letters were all seen as books worth hiding, so they survived the burning. It was the Holy Spirit that miraculously kept these books from being destroyed. By the year AD 325, there was universal agreement on the four Gospels, Acts, all the books written by Paul, Hebrews, and 1 Peter. The church was still unsure about James, all three of the Johns, 2 Peter, Jude, or the Apocalypse of John, or as we call it, Revelation. At the same time, there were some other books that were very popular, Clement, Barnabas, and the Shepherd of Hermas. In the year 363, at a council, a list of all the books considered to be part of the canon and inspired by the Holy Spirit were confirmed. This was all the books we have today except Revelation, and there was no other books added. Then in our last episode, Athanasius, we learned about the job Constantine gave Athanasius at the Council of Nicaea. He was supposed to write a letter each year to let the church know the dates of the Easter celebration. In his 39th letter, Athanasius writes a list of all the books of the New Testament. In his letter, he lists all 27 books we have today. Then in the year 393 in Hippo, the church agrees to the 27 books. 
And then again, four years later in 397 at the Council of Carthage, it was again agreed upon. The rules the church made to make sure no more books were added were this. The apostles wrote or recognized the book. It had orthodox teaching. The church recognized it. Then in the year 400, something happened that changed everything. First, we need to look at the life of a man named Jerome. Jerome was born in a Christian family. He was very smart and was educated in classical Greek philosophy. He loved learning. After school, he traveled all around in what is today Europe. He loved Gaul, today we call it France, and he loved Palestine, and today we call it Israel. In Palestine, he spent time in the Jewish communities and spent time with Jewish rabbis. Now, today we're told a lie that Palestine is not a Jewish community. The truth is, Rome changed the name of Israel to Palestine as a way of trying to erase history. The truth is, Rome changed the name of Israel to Palestine as a way of trying to erase Israel. The fact that we have Israel again is a miracle, but that's for another episode. One night, Jerome had a dream, and in his dream, Jesus was beating him up because he was spending so much time studying classical literature and not the Bible. When he woke up, he said he would never read pagan literature again. Then he began to live as a hermit. He followed the teachings that said, if you give up all the things that give you comfort, you'll be closer to God. He starved himself. He refused to sleep on beds. He started to have dreams about girls, and that made him think he needed to starve himself even more. Jerome joined a few different groups of monks. However, he was thrown out of all of the groups because he was so difficult to get along with. Then he found some hermits living together. So he joined that little group and then the hermits went back to living in the city just to get away from him. Then when he was 50, he finally returned to Rome and he was given the job of translating the Bible into Latin because at this point, most of the common people were speaking Latin. When he was working on the translation, he started a Bible study at the home of a wealthy woman named Paulina. Many young girls came to the study and he convinced them all that marriage and sexual relations were evil and that they would be better to just be brides of Jesus. Most of the girls became nuns and the profession of nuns at this point became so popular that the wealthy woman Paulina who was holding the Bible study actually built homes for these nuns. The men were very angry about this as all the young women were just swearing off men for life. At the same time, he was translating the Bible into Latin, but he refused to use the Septuagint. He wanted to use the original Hebrew. He was able to do that because he learned Hebrew when he was living with the Jewish people in Palestine because Palestine was made up of Jewish people. Later in the year 650, verses were added to the Latin Bible, and then in the year 735, the first English Bible was translated. We're going to talk more about that when we get to that time period. But it was Jerome's Bible, the Latin Vulgate, that started the translations into what we have today. Okay, so to sum up how we got our Bible, you can see the New Testament was written in the first 70 years after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then organically, or I would say through the power of the Holy Spirit, the books were preserved, copied, and spread. I heard a preacher say at one time, the question we have to ask is, did the church make the Bible or did the Bible make the church? But is the Bible corrupt? I mean, do we have the same Bible today? I mean, all those copies, it would seem like for sure it was corrupted. Well, today we have 24,000 970 manuscripts from before the Latin translation. All these manuscripts match each other and match the Bible we have today. Think about that. 24,970 perfect copies that match the Bibles we have today. That is a lot of copies to have. So that's how we got our Bible. In our next episode, we're going to talk about a man who stood up to the Roman emperor, who by the way was a mass murderer. You're not gonna wanna miss that one. So subscribe so you don't miss it. For more podcasts, blogs, and videos, check out lauraleesiemens.com. But hey, do you wanna take your church service to the next level and reach a much larger audience? I will transform your raw church audio into a podcast and manage your podcast for you. To learn more about that, check out Lauralee Productions in the link in the show notes, and I will see you next week.